Hi, my name is Dr. Jude Capo. I'm the chair of the latest cast issue paper number 53, which is entitled Animal Feed versus Human Food Challenges and Opportunities in Sustaining Animal Agriculture Towards 2050. Before I begin, I'd like to gratefully acknowledge the contributions of my co authors, Dr. Larry Berger at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, Dr. Mindy Prashears at Texas Tech University and Dr. Helen Jensen at Iowa State University. I'd also like to thank our cast liaison and reviewers for their comments and edits during the preparation of the report. The report as it stands was to investigate the often heard claim that animal agriculture competes with human food for production on a global basis. As you've often seen and heard, and it's, it's a sobering reality, but globally one in eight children are hungry. And this isn't simply an issue that applies to far off countries. It isn't just about e Ethiopia or India or China. The same issues apply in the developed world as well. This is a global average. One in eight kids are hungry, 12.5% of the total population. And potentially this could get worse. The global population passed 7 billion people in November 2011. By the year 2050, we're predicted to have 9.5 billion people. Therefore, to feed all of those people, we need 60% more food, according to the FAO. But if we look at this graph, which is meat consumption, going from 1980 to 2050, you can see that we obviously need more beef, more pork, and more chicken, the green bars. But we face a dual challenge is that as we have more and more people we have proportionally less arable land per person which is the purple line. So we need to improve efficiency and improve productivity in animal agriculture to feed everybody. Unfortunately the oft-seen perception as depicted by this picture by, uh, by Alexis Rockman is often that technology, efficiency, productivity are bad words in terms of food. We enjoy having our hybrid cars and our iPads and our laptops, but technology in food is often thought of as bad. Modern agriculture is often thought of as dangerous, scary frightening compared to how it was 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. There's a perception that modern agriculture as a whole competes far more than it did in the past. Well, let's think about this. We see things like this quote, the feed cost of an 8 ounce steak will feed 45 to 50 bowls with cooked cereal grains. So the perception is we take all the animal feed that we feed to animals and we feed it to people instead on the assumption that we're all happy to eat corn every day, which is an interesting diet, to say the least. But it does lead to the supposition that cows are literally taking food out of the mouths of hungry children every single day. Now this is based on the concept of feed efficiency. And we define feed efficiency as the amount of feed, i.e. the mass, pounds, tons, kilos, required to make a unit of weight gain, milk production, or a dozen eggs. But the question is, could we feed all the feed that we feed to animals to people? Are all feeds the same? And the simple answer is that they're not. Some are human edible and some are human inedible. If we look at this graph here, this is some data from a really nice paper from the UK which came out in 2011, and they looked at redefining feed efficiency, not simply on mass in versus mass out, but the proportion of the animal's diet that is human edible versus the proportion of the animal product coming out that is human edible. For example, grasses, which is the first a green bar, are completely human inedible. We can't eat those. Whereas we can eat about 80% of cereals and pulses, for example, which are the second bar. It is a total misnomer to assume we can take all the feed that we feed to animals and just feed it to people instead. We are not ruminant animals, we are not pigs, we are not chickens. We can't digest and absorb the feeds that we feed to animals in, in the same way 
that they can. So if we re-examine feed efficiency, not as I say on mass in versus mass out, but the human edible energy going into those animals versus the human edible energy coming out, we see a different picture. Because if you look at the first two bars, dairy in the yellow and suckler or grass-fed beef in the green, from this claim of 8 to 1, 10 to 1, even 30 to 1 times more feed going in versus feed coming out, we suddenly see that dairy gives out twice as much human edible energy as she ever takes in. The dairy cow is fabulous for that. But to be fair, we don't eat dairy and beef and pork and poultry for energy, we eat it for protein. So let's look at it on a protein basis. And again, you can see that dairy and grass-fed beef give out more human edible protein than they ever take in in terms of, of their feed. That's a huge advantage that animal agriculture gives us. And there are other advantages as well. Every single picture on this slide represents an industry from which we get by-product feeds that can be safely, efficiently fed to animals. Whether it's candy, whether it's apple pomace, whether it's peas, all of these things which either can't be or aren't desirable as human feeds, because they're waste effectively, can be safely fed to animals to make milk, meat and eggs every single day. But we still have the perception that we take up all of this land to grow animals where we could instead grow, let's say, artichokes or cabbages or grapes. The perception that if on any patch of land, if you can grow grass, you can grow corn, which I was told by an activist about four years ago now, is simply untrue. We have certain areas of the world ideally suited to growing corn or grapes or mangoes or soy. And we have other vast areas of pasture land where the best use for that land is to raise animals because we simply can't raise human food on it. The animal agriculture industry has a huge advantage going for it in that through the use of cattle and other animals we can turn forages, we can turn pastures, we can turn grasses and all of those by-product feeds that I t talked about earlier into safe, affordable, nutritious milk, meat and eggs to feed that growing population. That is a sustainable food system. Now if we talk about that word, that S word, we've got to think about three factors. Em environmental responsibility, economic viability and social acceptability and the social side is becoming more and more important because the global animal agriculture industry is faced with a challenge every single day by the anti-animal ag groups. These groups like PETA, HSUS know the messages and the images that get across to the consumer. And let's face it, for most consumers it's relatively easy to eat a little less meat or dairy or eggs on the basis of saving the planet basically which again is what these images try to portray so that leads us to the issue of meatless mondays which first came in in about 2006 now the perception is that if everybody in the us or indeed in the world went meatless every monday we would single-handedly save the planet well, it's simply not true. In the United States at the moment, for example, we've got 314 million people, everybody from a tiny baby to an elderly person. If everybody went meatless every Monday for a whole year in the States, yes, it would cut our national carbon footprint, but it would be by less than one third of one. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny decrease. And it leads to other questions as well. Every picture on this slide, whether it's a tennis racket, whether it's gummy bears, whether it's deodorant, whether it's chalk, every picture represents a, a product that has inputs from animal agriculture. What would be the cost of sourcing all of these if, if we didn't have animal agriculture on the planet? Because on a global basis we don't just get milk, meat and eggs. Yes, we get food. 
But either it's a small scale farmer in Botswana or a huge dairy operation in Idaho. Those farmers and ranchers every day also get income, they get draft power, security, fertilizer and many other benefits. Besides, it's not simply about everybody should eating milk, meat and eggs. Globally, the livestock industry gives us a whole range of benefits which we should take advantage of. So the question is, what is sustainable food? And in our definition, it's the efficient use of natural resources. It's caring for land, air, water and wildlife with the intention of making that safe, affordable food to feed everybody every single day. There is no one-size-fits-all system. There is no everybody should farm or ranch as they do in this country or in this system or in this place. But if globally we improve productivity and efficiency, we can have a sustainable food system and feed more people. We've done that in the States, in the dairy industry over the last 60 years or so. This was some data that was published in the Journal of Animal Science in 2009, comparing the environmental impact of the dairy industry, again 1944 versus 2007. The purple line is 1944, the green bars are 2007. And you can see that per gallon of milk, because we now know better how to feed, care, breed and look after our animals every single day. We need fewer animals, less feed, less water and far less land per gallon of milk than we did in 1944. That's going to be particularly important as we have more and more people to feed. But we've also got a 63% decrease in the carbon footprint of milk over that time. Again, increasingly important. Perception is often that we should go back to the systems of the 1940s, 1950s. And as I say, there is no one size fits all. In any region, there will be more efficient or less efficient systems. But to make the implication that we shouldn't have modern agriculture, that we should simply have a grass fed system all the way through, simply doesn't work. In the States at the moment, we make 26.1 billion pounds of beef per year. We could change over whole scale to a totally grass-fed beef operation in the States. But it would come at a cost. We need 131 million acres more land. That's like 75% the land area of Texas, just to make the same amount of beef. From the beef industry, we'd have a higher carbon footprint. It would be equivalent to adding nearly 27 million ca cars to the road every year just to make again that same amount of beef, 26.1 billion pounds. And in terms of water use, which is going to be the really big environmental issue over the next year, two years, five years, ten years, annual water use would increase by 468 billion gallons. That's equivalent to the usage of 53 million households per year, a huge increase. As I say, there's a place for every system. There is no one size fits all, but we've got to think about the consequences of the choices that we make. One social example of that is the so-called pink slime, lean, finely textured beef. This was effectively taken out of the beef supply last year because of concerns in the media pushed on to the consumer and the retailer. But that comes at a cost. That safe, approved product had been in the beef industry for over 30 years. By taking it out, we have a loss to the beef system. That means we need more cattle to make the same amount of beef. More cattle means more land, more resources, more greenhouse gases, and so on and so on. But it also comes at an economic cost to the consumer. By taking it out according to research at Iowa State, beef retail price in increased by 1.6%. That's increasingly important in a world where people don't have enough income to buy food every single day. So we've got to think about how we can improve efficiency on a global basis. One of the biggest issues potentially could be 
parasite control. We understand the importance of treating for ticks or fleas or heartworms in our pets. The same consciousness should be extended to animal agriculture. If in the average 40 cow herd we simply treat our cattle with effective parasite control, we get better growth, better reproduction and the extra beef from that herd because of that will, will supply 19 families with their average beef demand per year. Again that's a huge benefit in terms of feeding hungry people. And in terms of one last thought, we've talked about animal agriculture using resources. Well globally we waste a third of our food. An entire third of it gets wasted every single day. So it's not just about animal agriculture versus human food. We as well have a charge to ourselves, to our kids, to our grandkids to waste less food, to make more efficient use of it. So that in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, the world will still be a good place for our kids and grandkids and their children to grow up. So I'd like to thank you very much. I very much hope that you would go to the cast website which is www.cast-science.org to download the paper and I'd like to thank you again and it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much.